name's Melinda Maxwell. I'm the oboist in BCMG. And what you just heard there was this beautiful instrument, the Aulos. And it was an improvisation that I made. I always improvise on this instrument because we don't know how this instrument sounded or the mus music that was played on it. We have fragments of ancient Greek notation that are slowly being discovered now. But the beauty of this instrument is that my ear is the sole factor in leading and driving the music that comes out as I play. And this is the fundamental nub of my PhD research, which is to do with trying to find the essence of oboe character. What is it? Where can I take it in a musical language? Can I make music that comes from an oboe character? And, and how do I define that? So I'll just very, very briefly tell you a little bit about this instrument because it is an extraordinary find for me. I've always had a picture of it on my wall by Picasso. It's been with me for 20, 30 years, and I sort of always loved it. I never quite knew what, what it was that this lovely character with horns was playing. And then when I started thinking about this instrument and researching it, I discovered that it's only just being revived. It's been asleep for centuries. This instrument here is a copy of um, an aulos that was dug up in northern Africa with its musician player, we, we suppose. And this original instrument is in the Louvre in Paris. And this copy of that instrument is called the Louvre aulos, which I bought um, about a year ago. It's completely beguiled me. I, as soon as I play it, I think, first off, my God, I've got two pipes, each with a double reed. I can make a sort of counterpoint. Uh, its date is about 400 BC, the instrument in, in the Louvre in Paris. So it was played in the Greco-Roman Empire. And these instruments were ubiquitous. They also go back to ancient Egypt, to the Etruscans, and way back beyond. And I sometimes wonder whether, you know, somebody somewhere put a blade of grass between their thumbs and blew it. You know, like we did as kids, we would make a little blade between our thumbs. And then maybe somebody put two blades between their thumbs and thought, wow, that's a very direct sound, which it is, if you've ever done it. It's a very direct sound. That is the beginning of a double reed sound. It's the air from the breath, the breath, of the breath blowing through these two blades and making a vibration and a sound. So these reeds here are exactly that. They're actually squashed bits of tube cane. We don't know quite what cane they use, but we're, we're getting there. We think it might be a cane called Phragmites that grows in Turkey and, and bits of the Mediterranean and the Middle East. It's a much softer cane, but this is a Rondo Donax, and they come from uh, a guy in France called Max Brumberg who has made them for me. And I've sort of scraped them and adapted them. This is the high pipe. And if I put all my fingers down, the bottom note is a D. And you can see that there's a thumb hole at the back to add another note. So if I was to move this bit of gum here, this is, this is a rubber ring. They probably use leather, I think, or brass, who knows. The bottom note with my little finger comes out a semitone lower. And if I play it with this pipe, whose bottom note is an A, I get a, a chord at the bottom that's a major third. So it sort of changes the music one's going to play because the bottom two notes have a different interval. So we can do this with the, the lower pipe. If I cover one of the holes as we go down, I get a semitone below the A, I get a G sharp, and this is a lovely sound. Let's play these two together. I find that terribly evocative. It's very dark. 
mysterious. Now, if I cover this last hole on the lower pipe, I get a bottom F sharp. And this is a very low sound with this C sharp. So that quality is there. And of course, if I do the same on this pipe, I can get a B and an A and another F sharp. So the flexibility of this instrument is really interesting. The other thing about it is the tuning. Of course, we have no recordings of this instrument. We have no idea how it sounded. There were many different types. This is just a type dug up in Northern Egypt. Some were bigger, much bigger. Some were smaller. They played them singly and they play them together. When I play it, it inspires me and I find music in it. That's part of my research and that's part of my piece. The music from Janus and in it comes initially from the Aulos. So this instrument, have you ever heard it before? I doubt it. It's extremely rare and it's only just being woken up there is a wonderful community now that I've discovered. There's a website called the Workshop of Dionysus and I belong to this community and it's a very few collection of musicians and colleagues that I've got to know and admire and respect who are looking into the revival of this exquisite instrument and all, and all of the instruments that are Aulos related. You see, its history is extraordinary because I think of it as the oldest oboe in the world. It's a double reed instrument. And here, here is my instrument. The journey between this and this is a very, very long one and a fascinating one. So. This instrument was played by men and women. It was played at uh, religious festivals, r ritual sacrifices, Olympic games, outdoor parties, theatrical events, and they accompanied singers. So they, they were everywhere. The other popular instrument was the lyre. The aulos was a uh, a sort of people's instrument. It was considered quite dangerous by Plato, for instance, who thought it was a bit dangerous for, for young gentlemen to learn because the music it plays was around Bacchanalian feasts where people would get frenzied and a bit out of order. So this instrument not only goes to that place, but it, it also is very refined because it was played after symposiums in ancient Rome. And so this history of the oboe is, for me, extraordinary because this instrument is the beginning. I want to put it in a context that's contemporary. I want to put it with the oboe, so I'll be playing the aulos and then a colleague of mine who's in this fantastic community, the Workshop of Dionysus, Callum Armstrong, will be playing in my piece as well. So I will be playing with him on the aulos and with me on the oboe. And of course the tuning is going to be, uh, for want of a better word, deliberately flexible because this is not built to play at A440, like our orchestral instruments. This, this is somewhere else. Let me just demonstrate how flexible this is, because we've got some unisons here that if I deliberately play out of tune, I don't know whether you'll hear, is, hear this, but there's a fluttering that happens with the pitch. It's called the critical ban when things aren't in tune. So this fluttering, where, where the pitch is, um, the tension, where it doesn't mix beautifully, creates this fantastic movement in the sound. When it does meet and they blend, you get this beautiful piece, this, this tranquility of sound. The semitones here are quite difficult to find. I get more on the high pipe, which you, I think you heard in my improvisation, I sort of found them, but these notes, You can see that my embouchure and my lip are forcing 
the pitch up or down. So it's, it's, it's flexible. If we have a bottom D and a bottom A, we have fourths. And if we were to move the fingers up step by step, we have a series of fourths. And this is, this is where the harmony gets really interesting. So let's just get the D in the right hand and the A in the left hand. And we hear these fourths. And of course, if I get, get, get fifths as well. Those intervals are very much part of the sound world of the aulos. There are scales that we can play that modulate on the aulos because of the change of the bottom notes and because of where we begin. The three most popular scales are Dorian, Lydian, and mixolydian. I've used the Dorian in my piece. I want people to hear this instrument. I think it's beautiful. You may have noticed there's these bits of blue gum. They're not ancient Greek. They're blue tack. And I had a lot more on the left pipe because my fingers find it very difficult to stay in this position, particularly this space here. It's very wide, and I couldn't get this finger to stay down. So the blue tack helped, and I've kept it here on the top hole because it helps me pitch that top note. Uh, one of these days I'm going to take it off because I don't like the look of it uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and, of course, these rubber rings are also not ancient Greek. They probably had leather strips that they moved up and down. And then in the Roman aulos, they had fantastic instruments that were covered in brass and they had little levers that they could shift with their little finger to open and close holes. And just to say about reeds, because if you imagine a bit of bamboo cane that long, you squeeze it in the middle, you make a waist, and then you absolutely squeeze the top end having made it wet, of course, and you squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, then you scrape it. And that is a very, very long process. And we're only just learning what to do and how to do it. There are books written about it, a bit, that come from ancient Greece, but we're in the 21st century. The environment's changed. We don't know whether the cane they used is what we are using. But the beauty of this instrument is that its sound is what directs my ear. I, there's no textbook about how to play this instrument. And for me, that's a fantastic freedom. How did they play it? How did it sound? What music did they play? So the beauty of this is that I'm going to make my own music and I'm going to give it to the revival of the Aulos because we want people to play this instrument, we want conservatoires to know about it, and we want young people to start to learn it. And maybe one day we'll have more Aulos players. So let me tell you a bit about my BCMG commission, which I've called Janus. Initially, when I was thinking about this piece, uh, the Aulos was very much in my environment. I was playing it. And I began to think of the idea of two, the idea of double, the idea of uh, mirrors, reflections, duets, doublings. And so this was sort of growing in my head. And then I happened to, just by chance, I went to an exhibition at the National Gallery, paintings by Nicolas Poussin. It, it was an extraordinary exhibition um, because his paintings there were just a few of them, but they were based on his obsession with Greek uh, stone release of, of dancers. Some of the paintings were totally extraordinary. One in particular, a dance to the music of time. I saw Janus, the two-headed Roman god of dualities, transformations, frames, gateways. He looks backwards and he looks forwards. And so I was looking at this picture and then I noticed the four dancers, which to me, you know, I was thinking the protagonists, obviously, you know, they're perhaps the seasons. It's the cycle that goes around forever and ever and ever. And on the other side of the picture is time that plays the lyre. And the whole composition is just breathtaking. So I was sort of looking at this picture and thinking, right, okay, Janus, doubles, mirrors, reflections, uh, different versions of the same thing. Now, different versions of the same thing is very much to do with what improvisation is. It's a part of what we do as improvisers. We elaborate, we extend, we take something a little bit further or not. This idea of 
making doubles. I thought, right, this is it. This is where I'm going to go in my piece. I decided to have four arches. I've called them arches because they're gateways through which the improvisation travels. So the improvisations around arch one are linked to that composition. They're quite short and each arch has its own scale. So the piece progresses through the four arches and it's very much the idea of keeping the idea of the music being alive in the moment, which is what I'm absolutely obsessed with. I'm trying to bring back the skills of performing, improvising and composing together. Because in my tradition, as a classically trained musician, you learnt an instrument or you composed. Improvising was nowhere. I began improvising when I was a student at York University a long time ago. And I sort of thought, ooh, uh, this is dangerous, but I'm, I'm really curious about this. I like it. I like it. And then when I was a professional oboe player jobbing around, you know, I worked a lot with the London Symphony Theatre in the 80s and 90s and still do, in fact. There were some fantastic outreach projects where we made music with all sorts of people using building blocks, cells of notes, rhythmic ideas that, that came from Ligeti or Berio. So th this, this sort of beginning actually really sowed a seed. And then when I took my master's in jazz performance at the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, that really changed my way of thinking completely. And I suddenly realized that improvising is the spirit of music, it's the stuff of it. Because even when we play our Schumann or our Mozart or our Bach, it's the space in between the notes that really make the music come, come alive. I want to bring these skills together and I want to find this essence of, of oboe. What is it? And so Janus is going to do this, I hope. The instrumentation for this piece is mainly wind with a few uh, other instruments sort of glue it together. So I've got me on aulos and Nadis Waram and oboe, another aulos player, a clarinet player, lovely colleague Ollie James from BCMG playing bass clarinet and clarinet, Percy Persclove on trumpet. So those are the wind instruments that will be playing in duets and trios and all sorts of things. And then there are, there's a bass, amplified bass, Sebastiano Desine, Liam Halloran on, on vibes and kit. These, these players are my collaborators in improvisation. And then there's Julian Warburton, BCMG, playing marimba and, and some more percussion. And then finally, another collaborator of mine called James Dooley, who is playing live electronics. Now, the reason for this is that I wanted something that was sustained as a sort of background place where all the sounds come from the aulos, the nalastoram, and the oboe. So they're single notes that have been torn apart, spread apart, dissected, double notes, triple notes that I've made of chords that are in Janus. So all the sounds in the live electronics are double reed based. He's very much um, gluing the sequence together for me. So, and he's also interacting in the performance. He will be using material on his laptop to make an exchange with what he hears. He won't be there all the time, it's just as and when. So Janus came into being and the Aulos is the beginning of it. So it's an exploration. I don't know how the music will sound in the improvisation bits. I have prescribed tracks on which we can travel because it needs to stay within the context of the piece. At the end of the piece, I've called it Four Memories because I thought, well, I could do one of two things. I could either have an open improvisation with all of them, with all my performer colleagues, or I can prescribe a route. So I've decided to do that. And what it is, it's sort of Janus looking back at what we've just played. So we go through each of the arches in turn but making a slightly different spin on each of them. It's a sort of recall, a different version of the same thing yet again. The pitches in Janus uh, start from the note B because B is very prominent on the oboe. It's not the bottom note, but it's, it's, it's a note that's very flexible because I can finger it like that and have all sorts of different colors in it. B is also prominent on the aulos, of course, and on the nalus where I am. So B is the sort of, it's not a tonic, it's a sort of, nub of the piece. And then I decided to have another note because I'm into twos in this piece. So F sharp, fifth, F natural, augmented fourth, tritone. So we have a settled pitch at interval the fifth and an unsettled one 
the tritone. Each of the arches spins around this center and they never have an F natural. The scales don't have an F natural. So I don't know whether this is gonna work orally, but the electronics does have an F natural and every so often it, it provokes. In the process of rehearsal, we will explore what is possible, what works, what doesn't work. And of course, the main thing about all this is I want to celebrate my musicians. The whole point of improvising is to allow their personalities to be expressed. This is the joy of being an improviser because how you play, how you make your music is your identity. And this is about personality and character. They're going to make this piece with me. Don't know yet how it's going to sound. I've got a sort of an idea. We'll see in the performance. In Janus, am I going to use extended techniques? This instrument has a very interesting background that we don't often hear. We try to play clean semitones on it, but it's very easy to adapt to something much more wild, like you heard on the Aulos. For instance, Again, I was just fiddling as I do, improvising. The thing is that I will only use extended techniques if the music needs it. I'm not going to say to myself, oh, I want to play my favorite multiphonic in that bit. No, no, no. These techniques are there to enhance what might happen in the moment. Um, so you heard there that I was able to play more than two notes. The aulos can also play more than two notes. If I put the whole reed in my mouth, all of them, I get um, a very high register and the sound completely splits and I get multiphonics. This instrument has a, a sound world that is hidden most of the time. We play, you know, The oboe is a sound that drew me in. I didn't know what it was when I was a young girl of 14. I heard a Mahler symphony, I heard this sound, I thought, my God, that's so beautiful. I want to learn it. I didn't know it had a double reed, and I didn't know we had to make these reeds all the time. But for some reason I kept going, and when I studied in Germany, I got a scholarship. I, I studied it for two years, solid because I thought at the age of uh, 21, I really needed to get this sorted out. It was, a, a, again, one of those moments in life where you think, right, this is it. This is my vehicle for my expression. I realized once I'd learned to play it to a hopefully good standard, and I'm still searching for this, a lot of modern music expressed something different and uncovered a sound world that is wild, that's a bit of a beast that's slightly off the wall, and I like that about the oboe. It's got a very nice, tranquil, beautiful, lyrical, pastoral character. But underneath, there's this dark underworld that modern music, a lot of it, goes to. It's sort of prehistoric, if you like. It goes back to its roots. And that's where the extended techniques come in because it sort of creates this music that is modern, but actually it's pretty rooted in something that I think is very old. And that's, that's where some musics today really excite me, like Bertwistle, Ligeti, Moderna, all these great, great people that have written for the oboe. 